So thank you so much for um, uh, allowing us to be part of this, um, this wonderful special issue uh, with so many great papers. Um, uh, thanks uh, to Jared and Rand for the, the, the great comments as well that you've already uh, sent along. Um, I have to disclose uh, or disclaim uh, that the views and opinions in this paper are the uh, personal ones of, uh, of myself and, and uh, Dara Morris. Dara is now Treasury, so she has to um, she has to have that in all of her paper presentations. Um, so this is a paper on small business survival uh, following uh, the government shutdowns uh, here in Alameda uh, County. Um, the uh, uh, the main sort of focus on this issue arises from uh, the importance of small business um, small businesses in this in this country. Um, just statistically, they account for the, the overwhelmingly uh, majority of, of business and establishments in this this country. Um, and uh, the idea that we have is that the ability for these businesses to survive is actually um, going to be heterogeneous in terms of um, how large they are. So not all small businesses are obviously the same size, and we. Um, sort of postulated that this, the size of a small business is actually going to be sort of um, really an important factor in the in the levers that they're able to pull in the event of a, a macroeconomic shock. And COVID, of course, being a, an extraordinarily uh, important macroeconomic shock. But the same principle could apply to say uh, a hurricane um, in, you know, in, in the Florida Panhandle, for instance, or, or floods elsewhere, um, where basically the local economy just shuts down entirely. Um, and so uh, part of us is just figure out what are those heterogeneities, how, how might they actually um, sort of affect businesses' operations, and then to, to sort of take that to some data that we have regarding COVID, uh, and then basically to also then apply it to a particular type of policy implementation regarding the, the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, sort of you know, why do we care about sort of heterogeneities in terms of business survival? Well, part of it grows from a macroeconomic literature that focuses on the importance of small businesses by size with respect to growth and employment. Uh, so within the macroeconomic literature, most of the focus has been on basically what we call micro businesses, which are generally regarded as businesses with fewer than five employees. Uh, and they tend to not be growth businesses, um, but there are a lot of them. And they're very important for community vibrancy and for local tax bases, for instance. And they're probably the small businesses that many of us are familiar with when we get coffee, when we go out to, to lunch, when we buy, you know, uh, local shops, uh, when we sort of buy um, items at a local shop, for instance. Uh, larger small businesses, which are often referred to as enterprises, tend to be growth oriented. And they're the more, um, they're sort of the engines of job creation that are often at the focus of policy discussions focusing on small business and job creation. Well, on the flip side, we also think that it's important to think about these two different types of small businesses with respect to firm survival. So instead of basically focusing on growth and sort of you know, um, uh, job creation, we're also thinking on sort of the flip side about well, what, what happens in terms of uh, a macroeconomic distress event, how do these different types of small businesses try to survive? And what does it say about the different types of policy interventions that might be helpful to these different types of survival strategies? So the reason that we uh, hypothesize that there's heterogeneities in survival, it uh, tends to do with what, how we think firms probably uh, differ in their survival mechanisms based on their firm size. And so we set up with a very you know, simple accounting frame where we basically say that your survival function is going to depend on your ability to maintain your uh, net revenues uh, in the event of a macroeconomic shock. And those net revenues are going to be a function of your overall uh, total revenues, less your labor costs, less whatever, what, uh, whatever other fixed costs you have to basically maintain to maintain the survival function. If we basically differentiate with respect to a macroeconomic shock, the idea is that each of these three components is going to be a potential lever that's going to affect your ability to survive. And so first, uh, we might think about you know, your ability to maintain revenues in the event of a macroeconomic shock. Um, so for instance, in COVID, it became popular to talk about the business pivot. You know, Instead of having in-dining uh, services, you have to have a delivery only service, a pickup only service. Uh, if you're a yoga studio, the ability to sort of do online sort of training as opposed to sort of in-person training. Also, you can try to focus on labor flexibility, which is basically cutting your labor costs as quickly as you can, which is possible in this country in part because um, by default, employees work as at-will workers, and you don't have to provide any notice of layoffs for most small businesses. Uh, so that turns out to be something that, you know, might be a cost that you can cut fairly quickly and fairly dramatically. Uh, 
Uh, and then finally, uh, there's committed costs. The idea that you know, if lease payments, maybe bank loans that are outstanding, uh, these can put you into bankruptcy. These are gonna be concerns that you're going to have if your revenues are of course following. All of this is within a context where we know empirically that small businesses have very little cash on hand. So it's not the case that we can then fall back on basically savings for any extended period of time. Now, the center sort of lever, labor flexibility, is where we think this source of heter heterogeneity arises. Um, and that's in part because larger firms are going to have, we hypothesize, uh, more employees that are going to be sort of dispensable in the event of a macroeconomic shock. And so we, in our paper, we have sort of these stylized examples uh, within the restaurant industry where you can imagine sort of a, a really small uh, you know, taqueria that has basically two core employees that do the cooking and, uh, and, and serving. Um, in the event that you have a macroeconomic shock, your ability to engage in labor flexibility is quite constrained in that particular example. Uh, that's gonna create at the margin an incentive to engage in the revenue pivot. Uh, and so, you know, we would think in those situations, you're not gonna be able to pull the, the labor flexibility lever. And so your ability to survive is gonna be largely a function of your ability to find revenue somewhere, somehow. Um, likewise, uh, Phil Strahan actually in an earlier discussion of this paper also suggested that smaller businesses may also, you know, maybe they're family run as well, which is also going to add in an additional constraint in the sense that you may not sort of be able to lay off, you know, your wife uh, or spouse uh, in the event of macroeconomic distress. So it would be my, you know, another reason why smaller businesses might have less labor flexibility. Uh, larger enterprises that are sort of more growth oriented would presumably be able to engage and more layoffs as a way to sort of preserve cash flow uh, during the macroeconomic stress. So that's going to be our sort of the, the core theory of heterogeneity is really going to be uh, around the size of a small business, uh, which again parallels sort of the growth oriented literature and focusing on basically, you know, how micro businesses are different from uh, enterprises in terms of their effect on job creation. We also think that given these heterogeneities, that also speaks to the different types of policy responses that we might think about if we're trying to basically assist companies uh, in the event of a macro distress event. So for instance, if we're focusing, if we're correct, if we're focusing on micro businesses, basically saving storefronts, um, making sure that you have the sort of community vibrancy after the shock, then perhaps we wanna think about how we can assist companies in that revenue pivot. Uh, and so in this regard, working capital loans tend not, you know, might be very helpful. You know, working capital loans are things like you know, providing loans to basically in the pandemic, basically buy plexiglass, buy protective gear, uh, helping to sort of turn to an online environment. Uh, labor cost subsidies are another approach we could take, which of course we see in the, the PPP, but we could also sort of implement this through uh, the tax code as well, through various uh, types of deductions um, and credits with respect to, to labor costs. Um, those would, if we're right, seem to be particularly useful with respect to enterprises uh, who, again, um, Sorry, those would be particularly useful, forgive me, with respect to uh, companies that have uh, an inability to engage in, uh, in layoffs because they have to keep those employees uh, on the books to stay in business. Um, and then with respect to larger enterprises, they're going to pull the labor cost flexibility lever. They're going to then be faced with presumably larger committed costs that they may have invested in with a growth-minded orient orientation prior to um, uh, the, the macroeconomic distress event. So those are sort of the implications we think you know, would be relevant with respect to these heterogeneities in firm size and survival. So turning to the data, we have data from an Oakland, a city of Oakland survey on small businesses that was implemented prior to the uh, shelter in place order in March of, of last year. Uh, and basically about a thousand firms uh, in the sample, which is approximately 10% of Oakland small businesses. We complement this data with uh, two other uh, data sets. Uh, one of them is safe graph foot traffic data, which allows us to basically evaluate how uh, certain businesses were frequented both before and after the pandemic, which is another way for, we, for us to look at uh, changes in revenue for small businesses that we can, particularly those in our survey that we can map to the safe graph foot traffic data set. Um, in addition, we also have the home-based data set, which basically provides data on uh, payroll costs for a sample of large businesses across uh, the, the country. Um, and then uh, the city of Oakland uh, implemented a second follow-up survey last summer uh, to evaluate how small businesses were using different types of um, federal government assistance programs. And so that allows us to look um, also at how companies were using the Paycheck Protection Program in differences in how businesses utilize uh, that particular uh, uh, policy implementation. With respect to the survey, 
a fairly good representation regarding the different types of industries that one might find in the small business uh, sector. Um, not surprisingly, uh, you know, slight uh, uh, preponderance of, uh, of, of restaurants and retail with, res with respect to the, the sample. Uh, in terms of size, we also see um, that our distribution by firm size tends to map largely to what you see nationwide, which is um, that, that most of the businesses um, turn out to be non-employer sole enterprises. Um, uh, but we also see a predominance of micro businesses as well, which, which we're labeling here as uh, one to five employees. Um, but one thing we've picked up from comments from folks is that we don't, we don't mean to overemphasize that this is basically there's something magic about five. Um, this is simply a way for us to try to think about how uh, there is this type of business that is gonna look and feel much more like a micro business rel relative to a growth oriented enterprise. Um, and so, so when we use, when we basically run all of our regressions, we run everything with um, log employees as a continuous measure. But for presentation purposes, we then translate that into this in the framework of sole proprietors, which we think sort of operate slightly differently because the literature suggests they often consume non-monetary utility. Micro business, businesses, which are what we're gonna sort of classify as somewhere between one and five employees and then enterprises, which are basically larger, larger uh, uh, firms. Okay, in terms of um, sort of the first lever, revenue resiliency, um, we first look at the survey data and our main measure uh, is basically the percentage decline in year over year revenues as of March of last year. Uh, we also have an um, a, a survey question with respect to their year over year change in revenue for February. So we can control to a certain extent on uh, pre-crisis uh, trends. Um, and so um, we're going to basically sort of evaluate the extent to which the decline in revenue during the, um, the sort of because of COVID, because of the, you know, the decline as of March, uh, is a function of whether you're a sole proprietor and the number of employees that you have. Again, we're going to treat sole proprietors as their own sort of group, in part because there is reason to believe that that particular type of organization does function um, or may function quite differently because of the idea that uh, they tend to be non-profitable, they tend to sort of, um, uh, they, they, the proprietors tend to uh, consume more than um, monetary uh, compensation, that there's some non-monetary compensation at work as well. With respect to um, the SafeGraph foot traffic data, so um, this, this data basically comes from a number of applications on people's cell phones that basically transmits location data um, pursuant to various um, user agreements that, that um, uh, individuals have provided. Uh, SafeGraph compiles this information um, and they, they also um, they map it to different points of interest, which we then map uh, to our survey respondents. And so um, this doesn't work so well for, for instance, landscaping firms, uh, but it does work quite well with respect to retail establishments and restaurants where we can basically map our survey uh, companies to the foot traffic data, which allows us to look at on a daily basis how their foot traffic is changing uh, in the period surrounding uh, the shelter in place uh, order. And we're also um, aided in this enterprise by the fact that, um, as it turns out, we can see from this map that uh, there's a, lar a lot of penetration of safe uh, graph users within the Alameda uh, County area, which is the, um, the county uh, highlighted in, in red. Oh, just overall, um, when you look at the safe uh, graph foot traffic data, you, you do see the types of trends that you would expect. And so this is just sort of overall for a sample of, of, of industries. Um, you see with the, the vertical line is the shelter in place order. And what you see is what you would expect. Uh, there's a, a rush to the grocery stores followed by a sharp decline and then an immediate decline with respect to fitness and recreation, uh, the restaurants, uh, I, we included electronics and, and appliances stores also to sort of illustrate that after a period of time, people started to sort of you know, invest in their homes and you sort of see that trend uh, as well. So the main estimation that we're gonna focus on is basically uh, daily foot traffic as a function of pre-crisis firm size by employee count uh, pre and post uh, crisis with, with firm fixed effects as well as time fixed effects. Okay, so um, for the survey results, um, so this is basically the regression results that we, we get. I'm just focusing on sort of the fourth column where we're able to uh, include some industry uh, and location fixed effects uh, as well as controlling for prior uh, declines, prior trends in, in revenue. Uh, what we see is what we uh, were expecting to see, which is that it turns out that the larger um, the firm, uh, the greater your year over year revenue uh, declines were. Um, Non-employers as well also had a larger decline in revenues, which is consistent um, as well, which is if to the extent non-employers are consuming non-monetary utility, they may have less of an incentive to sort of, you know, engage in that hustle to pivot. Uh, this is especially the case if it's a 
employer who's maybe perhaps working out of their, their own home, for instance. Um, with respect to the safe graph uh, foot traffic data, we also see very similar uh, results as well, which is larger firms seem to have a, a greater decline in foot traffic, which we're using as a proxy for, for revenue. Um, when we, we look at sort of the survey results just visually, again, sort of just translating those, the, the basically the continuous analysis we did into sort of this, these uh, um, categories of, of business, uh, non-employer micro businesses and enterprises, uh, we can see that it, it looks like micro businesses did suffer slightly less uh, declines in revenues, but we, we don't intend to put um, you know, a whole lot of emphasis in this. This is largely just uh, consistent with the idea that it's possible, it's conceivable that micro businesses at the margin have a, a perhaps a greater incentive to engage in that pivot and maintain uh, and to maintain revenue. Um, very consistent results when we look at the um, the foot traffic decline in foot traffic the decline in foot traffic following uh, the shelter in place order as well as we can see from this uh, this figure. Um, most of our um, sort of core findings uh, we really believe uh, have to do with the labor flexibility uh, analyses, and for these. Um, uh, again, we look at the survey, the Oakland survey, looking at uh, the self-reported change in full and part-time employees from prior to the shelter-in-place order to post-shelter-in-place uh, order. And um, we're able to control, to a certain extent, the decline in revenue. So basically leveling on the, the decline in level to, uh, in revenue, to what extent did larger enterprises engage in labor flexibility? Did they lay off more as a fraction of their pre crisis uh, workforce than, than micro businesses. Um, this is really a study between micro businesses and enterprises at, at sort of a, a broader, um, at a broader scale as non-employers can't engage in this type of enterprise at all. Uh, you can see from this picture that within our survey respondents, um, you know, the vast majority actually didn't lay off any employees, um, but you can see that some of them laid off half, for instance, half or more of their uh, employees as well. Um, the other data set that we use to supplement our analysis is the home base uh, data set with respect to labor costs. Uh, and here we focus um, uh, on, a nat on the national set of firms, although it turns out the results are the same if we confine it to the Oakland Bay Area firms. Um, and the idea here is we want to look at, um, and this reports on a, uh, on a weekly basis, overall labor costs. And so we're just going to look uh, at, on a weekly basis, pre and post prices, the change in labor overall labor costs per establishment as a function um, of the, the um, industry uh, zip code amount of foot traffic uh, to basically to provide um, a, a proxy for revenue uh, on a pre and post basis and po pre and post being uh, 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 California statewide shutdown. With respect to the survey results, uh, what we see is a fairly um, pronounced difference between uh, what we're referring to as enterprises and micro businesses with respect to their um, uh, engagement with this labor flexibility channel for surviving the crisis. They laid off, enterprises laid off considerably more of their workforce on a full time basis and on a part time basis relative to, to micro businesses. Um, again, consistent with this idea that micro businesses seem to have less of an ability to engage in labor flexibility during this particular crisis. Uh, and we see that uh, same result with respect to the home base data as well. Overall, micro businesses uh, maintained more of their pre crisis payroll relative to firms uh, that we classified as uh, well, relative to, to larger firms. Uh, just to repeat, all of these analyses were done uh, using um, employee headcount on a continuous basis within, in the aggression analyses. And so, what this is is really just a visual translation of this uh, within this. Um, convention of looking at small businesses as micro businesses or uh, larger enterprises. With respect to committed costs, um, we don't have a very good measure of committed costs within our survey results. And so basically we uh, rely on our accounting frame as a way to sort of get a sense for how businesses might differ uh, on their concern about longer term obligations such as rent, uh, uh, working capital loans. Um, and so the idea is that, you know, once we level on both revenue declines as well as changes in your labor force, um, then to the extent that a firm continues to be uh, concerned about uh, survival, um, then that could be picking up on concerns about their ability to maintain uh, rent payments, uh, for instance. Um, so that's going to be the strategy that we take. And so the idea is that we're going to take advantage of a self-reported measure in the Oakland survey that talks about how concerned are you about permanent closure. And the idea is, well, once you level firms on your decline in revenues and the 
your, your, your labor flexibility, how many employees you've, you've laid off, then that residual difference uh, should pick up the what we call sort of you know, concern about committed, committed costs. Um, and so what we see uh, when we uh, run that analysis um, is largely consistent with what we were hypothesizing at the, at the front end, which is that um, it does seem to be the case, if you look at non-employers, for instance, um, that um, non-employers um, you know, are uh, concerned about uh, uh, survival. Um, but where we really see in micro business are also concerned about survival, but where we really see the difference is um, the fact that larger enterprises seem to um, be notably more concerned uh, once we run this, this analysis, which would be consistent with this idea that um, longer term enterprises, as they're going into the crisis in, in it last January, last February, you know, perhaps they're investing in growth, building in, out real estate, taking out larger leases, they would naturally be more concerned about the ability to maintain those commitments uh, following a, a tremendous drop in, in revenue. So that's, um, that was uh, sort of with respect to the first Oakland survey. Uh, and it sort of points to this idea that we can try to think about whether the, the policy responses to trying to aid companies and, and firms in a, in a crisis are really appropriate to the different types of survival mechanisms they may turn to. Uh, and so we see you know, that the idea that um, to the extent a firm is trying to engage in revenue resiliency, um, then that's very compatible uh, with a, a subsidized working capital loan, which is consistent with actually the conventional small business association emergency disaster loans is really designed for uh, working capital purposes to help companies rebuild in the event of a hurricane or a natural disaster. Um, with respect to labor costs and subsidies, such as uh, what we see with respect to the Paycheck Protection Program, for instance, um, those are also going to be, you know, highly um, uh, very helpful to a business that feels that they can't lay off their employees, or if they lay off their employees, that's basically shutting down. Um, it's less effective, however, for a larger firm who actually may be able to sort of shed their labor costs considerably, but they may have more concerns about their ability to basically pay uh, to make rent. Um, uh, and so we saw a bit of this actually in the conversation regarding the Paycheck Protection Program, um, uh, where, um, well, as most, most of us know, the Paycheck Protection Program was largely uh, a program to provide free, um, uh, be, be, um, forgivable loans to small businesses to the extent they deployed those for la primarily labor costs. It was originally designed to be a requirement that you had to pay 75% of the loan towards labor costs to achieve full forgiveness. And the small business community pushed back pretty hard on that as basically saying, you know, that is way too much uh, to require us to, to deploy towards labor since, you know, what we're really concerned about are fixed costs. Um, and so that Congress changed it um, in the middle of the summer to basically to, uh, take that 75% threshold down to, to 60%. Um, around that time, we actually then got a second survey from Oakland, which um, asked the question of, you know, what government programs have you used? Um, and then also, how concerned are you about the ability to, um, uh, to permanently close? And we, we, the, the questions were uh, sort of categorical, and these were the, the, the options. And we were interested in those firms that seemed like they are going to be able to make it through the medium to the long term. And so we focus on these 96 firms that uh, what we're curious about is like, what's special about these 96 firms that said they can make it to the medium to the, the long term. Um, and so uh, one of the questions they asked is the extent to which you applied for a paycheck protection program. Um, and so our thought was, you know, to, to what extent is it the case that your ability to survive um, may relate to sort of, you know, the ability that the paycheck protection program has helped you along. Um, it's possible that the Paycheck Protection Program was more helpful to these micro businesses than to enterprises um, in their ability to give hope to businesses to, um, to make it through, uh, through the woods. Um, this was, this, to the extent this is the case, it's somewhat consistent with the, the narrative that had been emerging uh, from the initial studies of the Paycheck Protection Program, which is it was largely a failure that it actually wasn't helping uh, businesses survive or to maintain uh, payrolls. Um, and so, uh, we try to look at this issue uh, using this, the survey, the second survey. Obviously, we have a selection uh, concern. Um, our uh, identifi identifying assumption is going to um, hinge off of uh, Groundhouse finding that the differences in the success of getting a loan were largely uh, an artifact of the bank that you happen to be applying to. Uh, and so our focus is really going to be on those that applied for a PPP and some of them got the loan and some of them didn't. And so the idea is that the reasons uh, for getting a loan are largely orthogonal to 
the response of whether or not you were um, uh, likely to make it to a long-term or medium-term survival, uh, we're able to control to a certain extent on, um, uh, on the uh, on companies' um, post-crisis efforts in terms of the, whether they had shut down already or whether or not they had moved to an alternative business model. Uh, again, the focus on our empirics is on those that applied for a paycheck protection program. Uh, so we do, do see that there's um, quite a bit of variation in um, the, the acceptance rate, uh, as uh, I think most people are aware of uh, nationwide. Um, the overall result we see is that uh, when um, we condition on those firms that applied for a loan, uh, that those who accepted a loan were much, uh, were much more likely to report the ability to survive the medium term. What we see, however, is that there is an important interaction effect with respect to the firm size. And so this effect, this likelihood of reporting medium term survival diminishes the more employees the company reports uh, having. Um, and so uh, we've sort of graphically, if we sort of try to plot the margins of this, this effect, what we see is that um, really the, there's the um, uh, likelihood of saying that you're gonna survive the medium term uh, declines by size until you get to about five or six employees where it's not statistically different from, from zero. And so overall, this would be consistent with this idea that the Paycheck Protection Loan seemed to be particularly helpful to micro businesses or at least smaller businesses um, where it seems as if they have less of an ability to lay off employees in order to, um, to survive um, uh, the most recent um, uh, or survive the, the, the shutdown order. So overall, um, our main conclusions are that we seem to see considerable heterogeneities in how fir small firms try to survive a, a macroeconomic shock. Um, so one size fits policy programs would uh, be suboptimal, it would appear. And we see this to a certain extent within the PPP as well, which is of course the, you know, the largest small business program that was implemented uh, post COVID. Uh, it seems as if um, it actually was helpful to a particular class of small businesses less helpful uh, perhaps for larger enterprises um, who may uh, need more assistance with committed costs such as you know, uh, large real estate obligations uh, or repaying um, existing bank uh, term loans. So thank you very much. Uh, and I look forward to uh, the comments and uh, questions in the discussion.